Welcome to another uh, recording now in progress. Got it. Uh, so welcome to another Community Issues Forum and uh, once again by Zoom. And we've got one of, our, one of my favorite organizations and two of my favorite people, uh, Joelle Newman and Jen Ahrens, uh, representing the Peasley Neighborhood Center. And um, they have just, well, Peasley over the years has just done a marvelous job in terms of services in, in over the Rhine neighborhood, but they are now extending their community organizing ability and policy development area into both the neighborhood development rubric, which they developed over a year ago, and it's had some, already had some impact on City Hall, but now are working on inclusionary housing. I'll let them discuss just what inclusionary housing means and what they just came off of a, a long, was it two days ago, where you had a whole coalition of groups that are working on this issue. So we're, what we're doing today is getting an update on where things stand with both inclusionary housing and that develop, developing that as a policy and the rubric, which really goes hand in glove with the inclusionary housing. And uh, Joelle Newman, who is one of the top city community or organizers, as well as uh, Jen Ahrens, who's there also educate, education coordinator, were both participant, participants in this latest round on inclusionary housing. So I turn it over to them to see how they want to proceed with this uh, and how that, how that event went. Welcome to you both. Yeah, thanks so much, Bill. And thank you, uh, Christchurch, for always having us. You all are always so supportive of all of our work. Um, and just having the space really means, um, it means a lot to us, especially just um, connecting with the community, getting feedback, um, and kind of sharing some of the word of some of the, yeah, the work that we've been doing um, and how we are hoping to kind of move the city on community levels, but then also at uh, elected official levels. So um, as Bill mentioned, my name is Joelle Newman. I'm the community organizer here at Peasley. Um, yeah, I'm Jen Ahrens. I uh, coordinate our education programs. And um, as Bill mentioned, we actually just on Tuesday had like a really in-depth uh, community uh, kind of public education event on inclusionary housing. We had a lot of community co-sponsors that really helped us get the word out. Um, and we feel like it really just speaks to um, the commitment on the community level to try to get some policies in place regarding um, housing and equity and things. And we know that housing, it's not just a one tool thing that's gonna like fix our housing crisis. Like I'm sure all of the people here and kind of listening in are familiar that and know that we're in like a housing crisis, not only nationally, but we feel it here in our city. Um, and so it's not just going to be one policy solution that like gives us the th almost 30,000 units that's needed for our, for our city. Um, but what we do know is that it takes a collective of different types of policies. And so we at Peasley, we excitedly always work in coalition with folks who are doing good, like equitable policies um, on different fronts, especially regarding housing. But we've been excited to really dive into and kind of take the lead on this like discussion and conversation around inclusionary housing and what does it mean, um, like what opportunities does um, use of our public incentives offer us as far as community benefits and to see kind of some gains regarding um, affordable housing units and production of that. So that's mostly what we're kind of going to talk with you all about today. It's um, a little kind of shorter snippet of our um, event that we had on Tuesday, and we kind of have some exciting updates regarding that toward the end. Um, but yeah, if it's okay, we'll probably share our screen, share a couple slides, and then always uh, leave time for questions and any thoughts and feedback. Great. We know a couple of you were at the event on, on uh, Tuesday night, so apologies if there's like some <laughs> redundancy, but uh, hopefully with the Q&A time, we'll have, uh, you know, you can direct us uh, to whatever other places we uh, might want to go to today. Um, and so most of our, like we at Peasley, the entire reason um, we kind of focused on inclusionary housing policy has been related to equity. Um, because our concern isn't just like um, policies being in place for the sake of policies, but how do 
our public policies play a role in equity and how, do that, how does that equity impact uh, people who have most been impacted? So that's gonna be kind of the focus and the center of that. Um, and we always like to start off with, I'm sure you all, um, most people of this group are very familiar with PISA, but we do just like to kind of ground the conversation because sometimes it can kind of be a question of like, oh, like why is Peasley, who I usually associate working with kids and doing cool like arts projects, <laughs> um, like why are you talking about housing policy? Um, and so uh, Peasley actually has just a really unique history around community control of like public land and what that means to have community control. So um, Peasley, as most people know, used to be an elementary school in our home neighborhood of Over the Rhine. Um, and then when there was a public decision, again, a public building that had been supported by um, public resources as a public elementary school, um, when there was a decision to close that building, um, there were moms and grandmas connected to Peasley and connected in the neighborhood concerned with what's going to happen to our public resource. Um, again, the resource that we poured public energy into that the community has sustained and supported, um, what's going to happen to that space. So kind of in a long um, range of events from lawsuits to um, closing of school buildings and then eventually raising a little over $200,000. Um, our local moms, who we call our Peasley moms, um, got the keys to the building um, December 14th. And so we're celebrating, um, it'll be 38 years this upcoming December, that we've been a community-based organization. But from that um, experience and from other local experiences in the neighborhood, knowing um, the difference that happens when there's like community control of community resources or when community resources are used for public good and public equity, um, we kind of have always carried that history and that legacy with us as we've continued to do our work. Um, and obviously, as there's been rampant changes to see um, that have been seen happen in our neighborhood um, with many examples of public resources being used, um, but actual community harm coming down by way oftentimes of displacement, um, displacement of people, displacement of resources, displacement of community anchors. Um, we at Peasley really wanted to kind of hone in on, okay, if we're using public benefits and public subsidies, what is a better way forward rather than um, not only just stopping the harm that's happening, um, but also ensuring that there's some type of public return for our public investment. Um, and so that's really kind of what steered us to kind of have this conversation or start doing research into what other cities um, were doing regarding um, ensuring that there was some type of um, equitable exchange between public resources and the communities that they were going in. Yeah, I can jump in, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I do think it's a, it's important. I think so often when we look at these kind of big uh, social challenges, right, like people reach to uh, solutions that are in the private sector, right? And it's not that there are no solutions in the private sector, surely there are, uh, but I think it, it makes a lot of sense to look at what, you know, the, like the things we share and the things that we like co-control, right? And like, what is our, what is our civic capacity, our, our agency, our ability to impact um, things collectively, right? That they, those land in the public sphere. So it's not just phil like philanthropic institutions. It's not just nonprofits, right? We've, we've already seen the limitations of what those things can do. But, uh, but when we dig in and say, these are big public problems and our local government, our local jurisdiction has a huge role to play. And other local governments are doing that, right? Uh, nobody's doing it a hundred percent perfectly, but like uh, we could surely be doing it better than we're doing now. So I think it's important to, to remember that. Um, we won't go through all of these slides in the same kind of detail we did the other night, but I think always when we talk about uh, these issues, before we go right to like, here is the policy solution, like it helps to just every time say, like, remind ourselves, like, what is the central problem here? And what does that actually mean? Like, what are we trying to solve? And, and, uh, and to be clear eyed about it. So I think um, I think there's a lot of talk right now in City Hall about like, oh, our problem on the housing stuff, it's just a general supply problem. It's just a general growth problem, right? Like um, our housing issue, we just need to make more housing in general, and that's going to solve our affor affordable housing problem. And that runs contrary to the facts, right? Like uh, we have been growing. We've seen a lot of growth. Cincinnati has seen a lot of growth, a lot of uptick in production. Uh, the central issue, right, is that 
that growth, when it's driven by profit, when it's driven by the private market, it just doesn't do everything that we need it to do, right? It leaves out whole sectors of our community because they are deemed not profitable, right? Uh, and that's the inherent kind of discrimination of the market, right? Uh, so it's not that the, the private market here doesn't have a role to play. It's that we, it's a, it's a mistake to continue to think that the market will just solve the issues. And I think we all have to remember that this private market, the real estate market, the development market is a huge driver of how we got to this problem in the first place, right? Like how we got to be so segregated, how whole sectors of our community cannot find housing that's priced uh, for them to afford it, right? So I think um, it's not to pretend that like we don't need the capital from the private market. Of course we do, but uh, but it's not going to solve it because it's not equipped to solve it, right? The, what the market's really good at is developing certain kinds of stuff efficiently, right? What it does doesn't do and what it literally is not designed to do is to create the kinds of communities that we all say we want to live in, right? We say we want to live in equitable communities where people from different backgrounds coexist and, um, and live side by side and live well, right? So I think what we always want to stress is that, right, it, when, we, you, when we toss around the buzzwords like equity, right, equitable, what does that actually mean? That means like we have to very intentionally tie uh, fairness and justice into how we grow, into those larger goals of an economy. Um, and, and we know we have to do that, right? These aren't new problems. These are really old problems. So we have to keep reminding ourselves that. Um, and just to acknowledge that, you know, I think a lot of people have uh, misconceptions about um, what the federal government and the nonprofits are already doing are able to do. Um, and there's sort of like an understanding that like, oh yeah, well, people who qualify for subsidy, you know, they're everybody get, all these people qualify for, you know, uh, get housing subsidies, right? Uh, and just to remind folks that like 75% of the households across our country who qualify for assistance from HUD don't actually get assistance from HUD, right? Uh, the, the federal, the public funding from a federal level falls dramatically short of where we need to be. Uh, and as a result, local governments, local jurisdictions try to step up to fill that gap, right? We should always be pu pushing for more federal and state dollars, but we need to supplement it. And I think one issue we see in Cincinnati is Cincinnati has made no significant effort to put any local resources, local dedicated resources to affordable housing uh, in, a, in, a, in a big way, right? Where other cities have. Um, and that's a huge issue that we need to continue to, to focus on. Yeah, and as Jen kind of talked about the central problem, we also just want to um, specifically talk about the ed like the specific need. So when we think about um, policies, and again, when we're using the word equity, like equity means addressing not only the problem, but ensuring that the policies that are created to address it are central to whatever what the specific need is. Um, and here in Cincinnati, we know that the specific need is for is specifically regarding housing is housing for folks who make the least amount of money in our in our community. So the folks who are most um, cash strapped by the wages that they're paid. Um, and so here in our city, kind of as I mentioned or alluded to, you know, we often hear the term of like, oh, we're like 40,000 units short in our county and we're like 28,000 units short in our city. Um, and just to kind of put that into perspective, when you hear that kind of 28,000 unit number, um, that number is specific to folks who are making 30% of like the area median income. And basically, basically when you think about that in like a rent or a income base, it's basically folks who are working minimum wage jobs. So people who are making about $18,000 a year, um, there's 28,000 individuals and families and households that can't find housing that they can afford, or they're overly cost burdened with their housing. So they're paying you know, the federal government says that you should pay no more than 30% of your income on um, like basically rent and utilities. And so that's basically saying that folks at the, at the bottom who are again, making the least um, are paying, you know, more than 30% of their income. They're paying like 50% of their income solely to have like a roof over their head every, uh, every night for themselves and their families. And when we really think about like, who does that impact? Um, I feel like all of us kind of have like a unique perspective on workers and laborers, especially over the last two years where um, a lot of us had the opportunity to um, shift our kind of work from home and like be um, our like work from home spaces. But when we think about like our essential workers, the ones that we were really heralding as heroes, 
throughout the pandemic, the people who were keeping our grocery stores running, like the people who were cleaning the buildings um, to ensure that those who still had to meet in person were able to do so safely. Like those are the people who are struggling to find housing the most in our community and in our city. And honestly, again, like nationwide. But when we think about a specific policy um, for Cincinnati, we know that there's a priority that needs to be placed on those, on folks making those incomes. And we often, or we always highlight um, whenever we talk about housing, the fact that the housing affordability issue is like two sides of the same coin. So one side, it's the housing being at rates that are um, higher than what people make. But the other side is obviously jobs and wages and the wages that people are paid. Um, and so we focus more on the housing affordability side, but we try to work we do intentionally work in coalition with folks who focus on the labor side as well. Um, Cause when we think about like uplifting and again, the fact that there's multiple um, things that are needed to address this issue, um, the wages as well as the affordability are two in the same. And so when just thinking about our specific problem and our central need, um, knowing that our problem and our need are directly tied um, to the wages that people are paid and what they can afford. And we know that that intrinsically leaks links um, specifically to who experiences that. So we know that this need and this problem falls more heavily on folks of color, on Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, and communities of color than it does on, uh, on white families and white households. And so when we talk about racial justice, when we talk about equity and desegregation of our neighborhoods, um, that needs to be central to whatever policy we, we, prioritize, uh, we prioritize, not only um, again, income levels and numbers and things, but the people who we know that this, um, who carry this burden on a different level. Yeah, we'll try to not get too, uh, <clears throat> too detailed here, but like, you know, sometimes, I think it's funny, I think like we, we're at a point now, I think in the city where people can recognize like, okay, yeah, we, ha we have an affordable housing crisis. And I've only been around here, you know, I'm not, I'm not from Cincinnati originally, I've only been around for about, uh, I think I'm coming up on eight years. But like, I've seen a, a shift in those eight years in the way that the rhetoric, especially in City Hall, has shifted to at least account, at least to like acknowledge that we have an affordable housing problem, right? And I think people were afraid to even say that, or just like didn't believe it was true. So I think, um, that is starting to shift, but it's not shifted well enough. I think like what's fascinating to me right now is, is that like contrary to the facts, contrary to the evidence, people are still debating like where our issues are, like what's our need, right? Um, and I think like it's it's on our public stewards, it's on our elected officials to like look to uh, the the data that we have, right? To like actually look where the need is. So I wanna I wanna acknowledge that like there's still all this buzz right now across the city about like how we have to incentivize workforce housing. Um, and it, it, that term, right, to, to kind of uh, harken back to what Joelle was saying, right, I, I think that can be a really misleading term, right, because typically people are using that term to describe um, the kind of range of income level between 80% AMI and 120% AMI. And I know the, you know, the terms are wonky and this is all done by HUD and the AMI stuff is like kind of nobody's favorite way to define uh, affordability, but it's everybody's go-to because it's the most standardized way, right? But generally speaking, you're not supposed to pay more than a third, roughly a third of your income on your housing alone, right? Uh, that's the that's the general metric. So then when you adjust for like, what do people make in the region? It's that, but right, HUD's definition, is, is the HUD's region that they look at is, is the general Cincinnati metro area, which is 15 counties, right? So we have to understand that like the measures there are inflated, are inflated in comparison to Hamilton County and they're super inflated when you look at just the city, right? And that's because of like, decades of disinvestment, redlining, all sorts of stuff that have economically um, challenged and burdened and oppressed people in the city central core. Um, but uh, we show this graphic because just as Joel was saying, right, like we have to look at who's cost burden, right? We have to look at who the market is already serving. Because why would we uh, design our public policies to get benefits for folks who are already benefiting from the from the general private market, right? Like it's not it's not logical. So we have to continue to say that. And and I, I know you all have probably heard us say this, and you've heard other people say it, but like it bears repeating, because our elected officials need to hear it over and over and over again. We are not, the goal is not to subsidize folks who already, you know, uh, households who already can find housing or to get jobs for folks who already have decent paying jobs, right? Like, 
Uh, so there is, there is stuff that falls under the umbrella of what we would call affordable or what HUD would call affordable in the metro area that is really meaningfully and practically not affordable or not where the need is in Cincinnati. So just want to show this graphic to show, right, we're looking at the, the orange and the red is like where folks are way are just overpaying for their rent, right? So in the orange, it's they're paying more than 30% of their income in the red, more than 50%, right? It's totally unsustainable, right? It's why it's why people spiral. You're just one, one mishap away from homelessness, right? Uh, it's why people are on the streets. It's why the shelters are full. It's because you can't sustain a living when you pay half of what you make just to have decent, and maybe not even decent, just to have shelter, right? So, uh, so we show this because I think when we are pressing our local officials to do policy well, we need to say this thing over here that you're talking about is not the goal. It's not the priority. It's not the need. So right now we see all these tax abatements giving out and the city is quick to say, oh yeah, this was a mixed income development. Okay, well, mixed income how? What, what, were, the, uh, what were the lower price points? And again and again, we're saying, oh, okay, we had a handful of units that are priced at 80% AMI. That's affordable. Right? So that is, that's higher than the median rents in the city, right? you're subsidizing stuff that's already a stretch for what's the baseline in the city. That's not good policy. It's not smart. And it's not ethical. So just to like really continue to remind people that like when you, when you look at these metrics, we shouldn't be using our, on a moral level even, right? We're using our taxpayer dollars to, to what? To subsidize and create and incentivize units that are, that are way out of range for people. Like we should not be looking, for, when it comes to rental stuff, we should not be subsidizing anything above 60% AMI. And um, when it comes to home ownership stuff, we shouldn't be subsidizing anything about eight, above 80% AMI. And that's because the market already takes care of it. Um, and it's not, it's not a priority. Um, so I think like we just have to keep saying that. And so like kind of um, just from all of the research, like thinking about again, the central problem, the central need, how do we like build equity um, at all, like into some type of policy to kind of address this? Um, we at Peasley really honed in on specifics regarding our incentives, as Jen mentioned. So when we think about like sale of public land, and these are again with um, public-private partnerships. So when a private developer is approaching the city um, and asking for public subsidies to help support its project, um, the city usually does way of that by um, what's seen as like in-kind things. So things of like reduced or free sale of public land, um, the use of a zoning change, so allowing for a private developer to build um, at a higher level or wider than the zoning tip than the zoning currently allows, um, and then also for tax abatements, which is like more like common in Cincinnati, and I feel like a lot of Cincinnatians have heard about this, but it's not really commonly used in other cities. Um, and so specifically, um, we kind of honed in on what's a national practice on, I think there's 700 cities or jurisdictions or municipalities that are using about a thousand different types of programs on what's deemed or termed inclusionary housing, which is basically a policy that requires some type of community benefit to be offered in exchange from the private project for the use of the public, of the public subsidy. Um, and kind of when thinking about like why um, cities use it, um, as we mentioned, we know that our city, um, similar to our state and similar to our federal government, can be um, strapped on the actual tangible resources as far as like funds that they're able to offer in support of different projects. Um, but what something is that's like more of an in-kind and something that doesn't necessarily cost, like have a direct cost for cities, are some of these like in-kind contributions that they give to that they give to private developers. Um, and here in Cincinnati, there has not been any type of um, transparent way that there's been expectations or requirements placed for that exchange. Um, currently, the conversation is just being presented that this exchange or these um, projects are getting these subsidies if, like, if there's a need presented for the private project. Um, but we've been doing a lot of research to really try to pinpoint the fact that um, with these subsidies, there's an opportunity for the community to receive a benefit. Um, and oftentimes nationally, this is mostly seen by the production of um, units of affordable housing. Um, and so as we mentioned, like, or as I'll say, inclusionary housing isn't 
um, usually the mainstream that's going to produce the most amount of units each year annually and things like that. Like that's why we um, fully support a dedicated funding resource to our affordable housing trust fund, because that where you actually have the cash for, that's where you're really going to see the production of units. But we know that there's another stream that's needed to get, again, to, if we're talking about building, trying to get 500, uh, <laughs> 700, like 1,000 units online a year, um, that need that needs to come from multiple streams. And so inclusionary housing is one of those streams that when there's an exchange again of those in-kind resources to a private project, um, that that private project has the ability to put some units online and to offer resources um, to the community that's felt. And again, like when we think about how to equitably do this, um, intentionally tying equity. Um, so sit again, centering like the people who have historically been most harmed by private development, the people who continue to be uh, oftentimes harmed um, with the way that we're currently doing things, um, intentionally tying like their experience and their needs to our public policies. Um, and that's how we do it equitably. And that's, and when we talk about like setting different uh, levels and things, we need to set it where the, where the need currently is. Like we don't need to try to set it to what, um, what's already being produced, but like setting, offering another source on the level and the need that we currently have. Um, and it, again, as Jen mentioned, it offers cities an opportunity to step into that gap that is left when there's like federal and state resources that are lacking. Um, so knowing that the federal government on its own isn't going to fix our problem, knowing that state and federal government on its own isn't going to fix our problem, cities have really stepped up as far as like, what solutions do we have to offer? What do we bring to the table to try to meet the needs of our folks? And just to give you, because uh, we, we maybe should have done this on Tuesday, but just to like give you an example of like, what, what does that look like, right? Uh, so typically in a city, it might be that you write a new policy that says any uh, new development that is uh, um, more than 20 residential units, right, um, has to do 10% of those units priced at say 60% of the area median income. So meaning uh, that you would charge no more than 30% uh, of people's income, but they have to be at that income level. So cities do it a different way in terms of uh, how, how they um, place folks in those, 